afternoon, everyone. It gives me great delight to invite you to this uh, Sustainable Seas webinar. And um, just a couple of housekeeping, housekeeping matters before we get going. Everyone will be muted during the seminar. And then at the end, there'll be time for questions, which we can open up to people present here and people who will be Skyping in through Zoom. And they can do that either through raising their hand or typing a question. And we just ask that they send those questions through to everyone so that we can have a look at that. And so this afternoon, I'd just like to thank Catchman's Otago, who are sponsoring Professor Costanza's visit here to the South Island, and Sustainable Seas, who are hosting this seminar, as well as the Centre for Sustainability are hosting us for this webinar today. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Robert Costanza from Australian National University in Canberra. Um, Professor Costanza has published over 600 papers, 27 books, so an extremely illustrious um, scientific career, and his work covers transdisciplinary science. So he's spearheaded ecological economics, worked in systems ecology, ecological modeling, and policy. So it's with great pleasure, I hand over to Professor Costanza, who's gonna be talking about valuing um, marine and coastal ecosystems this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thanks very much. <laughs> and welcome everyone, good to see some familiar faces here. And I know some of you heard I talked from last night and even before that. Uh, so um, I'll be covering some, uh, some familiar ground, uh, but hopefully we'll, we'll uh, uh, take us in a slightly different direction focused on um, valuing and managing marine and coastal uh, ecosystems and, and their services. Yeah, are we ready to go? Okay. So, is this always going to be part of the screen? <laughs> <right now? Yeah. laughs> so, I'm sure you all have heard the term ecosystem services and <clears throat> know what it means, the, the, the benefits that people derive from functioning ecosystems. Um, <clears throat> some people can uh, <clears throat> uh, misinterpret, I think, that the term services as meaning that, you know, it's these ecosystems are just out there for us. I don't think that's the intention at, at all. The idea is that that we are part of uh, the rest of nature. You know, we're we're part of this ecosystem. We have been, you know, through our entire existence as a species, and so we're highly interdependent uh, with with natural ecosystems. Um, but I think we've we sort of lost lost the plot a bit in recent in recent years and begun to think that no we were independent from nature it's like we can do we can do what we want so i think this is a, an, an attempt to sort of bring us back to the recognition that that still exists in most indigenous cultures you know that we are highly interdependent uh, with natural ecosystems um, we depend on them for a whole range of services and that's what this diagram from the millennium ecosystem assessment um, gets at you know, provisioning services we're maybe most familiar with, food and timber and fish, etc. Uh, but a whole range of um, <laughs> regulating services, including uh, climate regulation, carbon sequestration, storm protection, uh, flood protection, um, disease regulation, you know, water quality improvement, and a whole range of cultural uh, services, including recreation, uh, but also uh, educational, spiritual, aesthetic uh, connections with, with ecosystems. And a better understanding of how ecosystems are, uh, are supporting uh, these, these sort of services, which have a maybe more direct connection, this whole range of characteristics of human well-being that goes well beyond simply, you know, consumption of these provisioning services. Um, we need, you know, health, good social relations, um, et cetera. So well-being is a much more complex function and simply the more we consume the better off we are and uh, we have to recognize that also as part of the as part of the analysis um, there's one yeah, that works oh well what happened it's not four games in here either. I'll just that. So it's not forwarding to the next slide, either from here or from there. Oh, there we go. Okay, uh, so there's, 
something missing from this interaction, and that's the, the connection uh, that's required uh, between all of the, the other forms of capital assets uh, in order to produce uh, <clears throat> ecosystem services. They don't just flow from natural capital into sustainable well-being, but there's, a, you know, there's an interaction, uh, a complex interaction required. Uh, you have to have people to benefit from these, from these uh, services. You have to have a community to, to support those people. Uh, you have to have you know, some, some built infrastructure uh, to support this interaction. So it's really a very transdisciplinary problem you know, to understand how human well-being and the sustainability of that you know, uh, uh, results from the interaction of these four basic uh, types of assets over time, over space, uh, et cetera. You know, I think we're, we're far from understanding you know, the complexity of that, that set of interactions. And part of the reason is that we've been siloed into different, you know, uh, disciplines that are only studying part of the problem. Um, we have to spend a lot more time uh, studying the interactions and trying to put these different pieces together. So, um, you know, and the, the value then of these uh, of natural capital and ecosystem services is then defined as the relative contribution you know, among these different uh, components. Uh, to producing sustainable well-being. Uh, so how do we assess that value? Um, there's, there's lots of different ways. Um, and I think, again, that's, that's a very open research field. Um, you know, how, do, how do we begin to assess that, that value? It goes well beyond uh, looking at the market value of you know, uh, provisioning services. Most, if, uh, many, if not most, of these services are outside the market. Uh, they should stay outside the market. Market's not the best allocation mechanism uh, for, for managing these kinds of services. Uh, but, you know, how do, we, how do we then value them and put them into the decision-making process in a way that, uh, that, that, that works? Um, there's a range of uses for this valuation of ecosystem services and nat natural capital, um, including simply raising awareness and interest. So just making it clear that, you know, we do depend for our well-being on natural ecosystems in a much more fundamental way than um, and maybe has previously been recognized. Um, and so you can do that by you know, pointing out the, the relative value. Um, our national income and well-being accounts need to be revised significantly. Um, I talked last night about the problems with using GDP as a measure of societal well-being. It's a very limited and misleading um, indicator, and there are certainly efforts around these days to include uh, ecosystem services into our national accounts. <clears throat> that will make a big difference in terms of whether we're actually making progress or we're, whether we're, we're actually depleting our, our natural assets faster than we're, than we're increasing our, our built infrastructure, uh, which is, <coughs> but it's, we need to know, you know what that trade-off really is. Um, certainly specific policy analyses require that we understand, you know, what these trade-offs are. Um, are. Are we actually uh, creating a net benefit uh, from, from specific policies? Um, if we drain a wetland and put in a, you know, a, a, a shopping mall, uh, what, what have we lost in, in terms of these, uh, these valuable services? And is it really worth, worth it? Or should we put that shopping mall somewhere else? Um, land use planning, I think, also needs a better input of, e of ecosystem services ideas. Um, and I guess you could say coastal, uh, coastal planning as well. Um, this idea of payment for ecosystem services. So uh, this has become a very popular way of encouraging private landowners uh, to, to produce not just marketable goods, but the social goods that, that these ecosystem services represent. And they're there are probably a thousand or more of these uh, payment schemes using financial incentives to change behavior. Um, I wasn't ready for that yet. Sorry. <laughs> what happened? I know that. Yeah. Is this not? Oh. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, there was this idea of full cost accounting. Uh, so, you know, the price of everything that we buy in the market is really not the true cost. Uh, and that's leading us off in the wrong direction because it's not including the external 
the cost, the, the damages to ecosystems and their services. And finally, common asset trusts, and I'll spend some time on this uh, toward the end, um, that in order to manage these kinds of resources, which are non-rival, non-excludable public goods, um, we need <clears throat> other kinds of institutions and to treat them as common assets. Um, we need to build mechanisms and institutions and, and trusts uh, around these common assets. And certainly, uh, marine resources uh, fit, fit well into this, uh, this categorization of common assets that need, need a different approach to, to management. Um, there's a range of <coughs> techniques that have been used <coughs> to try to value uh, some of these resources. Um, and this is a, a, at least a partial list. As I said, I think there's, there's still a lot of work to do in this area. And I'll explain why, but um, just to give you an idea of some of the things that have been used. Um, this idea of avoided costs, and I'll give an example there. You know, if we if we uh, <clears throat> can uh, uh, maintain a natural capital asset, that we avoid uh, some kind of damages. Avoiding storm damages, for example, is one one example I'll talk about. Uh, replacement costs. You know, if we had to replace a service that a natural ecosystem was performing, you know, with a technological option, if we have to desalinate seawater instead of Instead of using uh, water, water from a watershed, uh, that's another way of getting at the, the value. <clears throat> um, and a range of other ones. Um, I won't go into details on all of them. Uh, some of them are based on sort of surveying um, people uh, <clears throat> and asking them in one form or another, you know, how much would they be willing to pay for protecting these, uh, these natural capital assets either sort of directly or asking them to evaluate different scenarios that have different trade-offs about those, um, those values embedded in them. So this idea of choice modeling. Uh, so getting at, um, you know, particularly cultural services and things like that, uh, this is probably one of the, the, the best ways to approach that. But a lot of the conventional techniques are based on surveying individual people and asking them to, you know, vote on or uh, their their values as individuals, and then sort of aggregating that, that up. Uh, in the same way you would do with a, a private good or service. If you're buying something in, in, the, in the supermarket, that's, that's, uh, that's what people are doing. They're making an individual choice. So when you're talking about a, a com community asset, um, that's not necessarily the best way to go. So you'd want to get, engage the community in discussing, deliberating you know, about what the value of those services are, Having some real exchange, coming to some more joint consensus about what the uh, those values might be. So, <clears throat> this idea of, of group valuation and deliberation, I think, is, is important. And finally, how do we build better models of how the underlying system works uh, in order to get at the the, the values? People don't necessarily uh, realize uh, or understand how ecosystems are contributing to their well-being. So, you have to do a much better job of of um, modeling that, that those connections. And that's, I think, where the scientific community comes in, uh, especially, and uh, to, to better understand those. <coughs> Something's preventing us from yeah. moving forward. Where did our IT person go? Okay, so I'll just get your help here again, Inga. We've got a, <laughs> it goes into a sort of a sleep mode for forwarding the slides. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <coughs> so I'll give one quick example of how when you go about um, doing an avoided cost estimate of the value of, of uh, coastal wetlands for storm protection. Uh, so this is Hurricane Katrina approaching the coast of Louisiana. There we go. Um, <clears throat> we know that on the coast, the, the Delta Plain of the Mississippi River, you know, it was built up over six, the last 6,000 years from sediments coming down the Mississippi River. Uh, but uh, since the eight, early 1800s, <laughs> they're not making it easy. <laughs> they're not making it easy. It was going to be open, but someone. Yeah. Yeah, there's something. It's like it, 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 that goes into a sleep <laughs> mode. <laughs> Uh, there, okay, that one? Right, there's one. Every time somebody wants to join, is it, yeah, that it's, stops it's it. doing something. Okay. Do you want me to do it again? No, wait, I got it here. Let's, let's see. So, and, yeah, so anyway, 
just to run through this quickly, a lot of these wetlands have been lost over the last 100 years or so, uh, largely because of um, levying along the Mississippi River. So all the sediments that were building the coastal marshes are now going off the edge of the continental shelf and they're creating this dead zone off the continental shelf. Uh, there's a lot of oil and gas exploration activity and they build these canals and spoiled banks through the, through the marshes. And so there's been a massive um, loss of these coastal wetlands and they have, in addition to you know, all of the other services that they're providing, one of the main ones is for storm protection. Um, and this is the, the storm surge that was caused by Hurricane Katrina, you know, 18 to 20 feet in height when it reached New Orleans. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so it caused massive flooding um, in, in New Orleans. We get similar similar kinds of things happening from the increasingly, you know, strong hurricanes that are, that are beginning to hit our coast. So how do we analyze the, the value of those wetlands for storm protection? Well, we know the history of storms uh, that have hit uh, all the places around the world. Um, the study we did uh, 10 years ago now, it was for the, uh, the U.S., but we've recently completed some uh, additional studies in China, and we're working on one in Australia. And eventually, we'll have more of a, a global database for this, but basically, we can look at the track of, tracks of the storms, um, how, many, uh, how much wetlands were in this, the track to do the production, uh, what sort of infrastructure was in the track, and we can get that uh, spatially from nighttime satellite imagery. Uh, we know uh, the data on the damages that each storm caused. We know the sort of intensity of the storm. So we can put that all together and come up with a statistical model you know, that relates the uh, relative damages <laughs> to the wetland area and the, um, and the wind speed. And uh, you know, from that, <clears throat> then we could say, well, what's the avoided cost? If we, we add another or subtract an air, a hectare of wetlands, how much is that going to change the, the, uh, the, the, the damages? Uh, that we can expect. So that, that you know, um, uh, for the 35 or so uh, hurricanes that we used in this study, you know, we can explain about 60% of the variation in the relative damages. Um, <clears throat> and we can begin to then use that to map uh, both the marginal value of the of a hectare of wetlands and sort of integrate under that curve and get the total value of wetlands for storm protection in, in dollars per square kilometer um, per year. And you can see that you know, where the, the large values are, you know, where those three things come together, where there's more storms to be protected from, there's more infrastructure to protect, and there's more wetlands to do, to do the protection. Um, so uh, bottom line from this, you know, the, the values are, are quite high, although there's a, a big variation. Uh, you know, the mean values are in the thousands of dollars per, per hectare per year just for storm protection, <clears throat> uh, not, not to mention, you know, recreation, not to mention fisheries, not to mention, uh, you know, all of the other services that we've, uh, that we've listed for, for wetlands. <clears throat> of course, the Corps of Engineers, you know, their first reaction to Hurricane Katrina was, let's build a giant levee along the whole coast of Louisiana. And, you know, that would have, first of all, started sinking immediately, it would not produce anything other than storm protection and that, and that not very well either. Uh, so this idea of, you know, well, let's use natural capital, let's use horizontal levees that are self-reproducing uh, to, to, uh, to perform this function, um, I think is more what we're talking about. So they've, they've gotten now into the, uh, the mode of, well, how do we redirect the sediments from the Mississippi River back into the coastal marshes so we can restore those, those marshes, so we can you know, restore the, the, uh, the services that these, these systems have been providing. Um, <clears throat> <coughs> Coastal um, catchments and watersheds also provide a lot of services. Uh, one of the more famous examples is this one in New York City, where they were faced with the choice of building a very expensive treatment plant or um, buying conservation rights and land in the watersheds that provided water to, this, uh, to, the, to the system. Uh, bottom line is they, they decided it was much more cost effective to use the natural capital uh, to provide water, and there are many cities around the country and the world, I guess, that, that have done this as well. Um, Portland, Oregon, right where I used to live, um, they have a very well-protected watershed, and so their water is not treated at all. It's just coming directly from, from this protected watershed. It has been like that for, for several decades. 
um, and other other cities are doing uh, uh, similar things and finding that that's that's a very cost effective way of using their natural capital uh, to provide a service that they would have to replace you know with much more expensive um, technology if they weren't doing that so it's a replacement cost sort of approach um, <clears throat> this was an interesting survey that was done recently uh, with um, <clears throat> uh, coastal and marine management um, personnel in Australia, about 80 of them, and they asked them, first of all, how important did they think um, valuing uh, this range of ecosystem services was? You know, how important is it to know the carbon sequestration value or the, you know, indigenous cultural <clears throat> value or the total economic value or the storm protection value? You can see that they thought it was pretty much pre uh, pretty important in general. Uh, to know what these values were in terms of how they they would then uh, be able to manage uh, the system. Um, <clears throat> but they also asked them how much they trusted the value estimates. And you can see they got a much lower score in that regard. Uh, because some of these techniques, you know, um, <clears throat> and for good reason, I think, uh, are, are prone to, to different kinds of uncertainties. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you're doing a survey, uh, of, pe of people for non-use values. Well, how well do people actually know the, you know, the system? Uh, <clears throat> how, how much can you trust their, their opinions? Um, so I think there's still a lot of work to do to improve these valuations. And another issue is that um, you know, the, the standard approach uh, to, to valuation is based on the goal of economic efficiency. How much are people willing to pay in some sense you know, to provide these these, uh, these services. Uh, but that's only one of at least three <laughs> major goals. Uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Maybe we needed two computers going yeah. on. Yeah. Could, yeah. <clears throat> um, that, you know, it's, and that, that goal is based on current individual preferences, and we know that people's preferences, you know, the standard economic approach is that People have preferences and they were kind of born with these preferences and they don't change, they're not affected by advertising or interaction with other people. Um, of course, we know that's not true. I mean, people basically construct their preferences as they interact with the process of, of making a decision. Uh, so there's that. Um, there's also the fact that that's not the only goal that we're concerned about. If we're talking about sustainable human well-being, uh, then you've got to understand um, about fairness and you have to understand sustainability. Uh, fairness, you know, in the sense of how is income and wealth distributed among, among people um, and these sort of community preferences, I think, then are, are really important uh, if you're trying to get at that goal. So this idea of you know, deliberation and group-based valuation, um, and you might think of John Rawls' idea of the, the veil of ignorance. You know, if we really didn't know where we were going to be in society, we would, we would vote in a fairer way. Uh, so uh, how can you sort of implement that kind of approach to valuation? And finally, sustainability, uh, which as I said, is not something that individual people are going to understand very well. If you're really trying to predict you know, what's going to happen to the system, uh, will it last, and how will it behave in the, in the future? And to get at that, I think you need to look at the whole system. You need to use, you know, uh, fairly sophisticated kinds of modeling approaches. Uh, but from a precautionary point of view, it's not like, you know, you, you, can, uh, you can know the answer you know, regardless of how sophisticated your model is. All models are wrong, but some are useful. You know? So how do we build models that recognize that, that limitation uh, going forward? And finally, um, we have to be aware of some like, mistaken identities. We can't get rid of this whole thing. Huh? <laughs> About ecosystem services and valuation, and uh, you know, first recognizing that economics is not the market. The market's just one institution within the economic system, but economics is about how to manage you know, everything that's important to us. Valuation is not the same thing as privatization or commodification or trading of these, these services. It's really how much do they contribute to, well -being, to sustainable well-being. And expressing these values in monetary units is not the same thing as, as market or exchange values. You're saying that these are 
um, monetary units are easier for people to understand. You're you're really expressing trade-offs in some in some units, you know, and so it could be could be other things that you're using to express the trade-offs. But monetary units communicate with a maybe a, a larger audience, but they're certainly not the only way. And you shouldn't um, assume that just because something stated in a, uh, a trade-off is stated in a, in monetary units that it really is about a, a market exchange. And we can't avoid valuation. But, you know, this is uh, every decision we make about um, ecosystems implies a certain valuation. So you know, we've got to make it more ex more explicit and less implicit. And uh, finally, somebody else wants to join. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Catherine. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Uh, the markets really only do a good job of allocating rival and excludable goods. Um, you know what those are? You know, rival good is something that my benefiting, you know, excludes you from, from uh, or prevents you from be benefiting. And excludable is, you know, how well can we prevent people from benefiting unless they, unless they pay us? So um, many of the ecosystem services we're talking about fit into one of the other three categories. Either common pool resources, you know, like a fish in the sea, um, or pure public goods that are non-excludable and non-rival. You know, most regulatory and cultural services, and, and then um, things that might be non-rival but excludable. Things like national parks, you know, which uh, uh, which are, are congestible. So um, we really need to have different kinds of institutions. Uh, ecosystem services is getting a lot more attention these days. Um, the, IPBES, who's heard of this before? Okay, not everyone. <laughs> They're coming out with a big report soon, so you'll probably, you'll probably hear about it. But it's kind of the IPCC equivalent for, for ecosystem services. Big international project uh, with intergovernmental you know, cooperation. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a big deal. There's the Ecosystem Services Partnership. And if you, if you get rid of this, we can see the website, but that's okay. You can, you can Google it. Um, you want to learn more about who's doing what and uh, participate in this in this uh, this effort. Uh, there's a big international conference coming up in Hanover, Germany, in October of this year, and there are also regional conferences. We're getting a lot of, of um, support, also from maybe some unexpected sources. Um, this is Ken Henry, the current chair of the National Australia Bank and the former treasurer. Um, and NAB, we've been working with them recently about um, trying to, to um, assess the natural capital assets of their, of their customers. Uh, you know, and he's making the point, it's not a natural capital, is not a footnote in a business plan, it's a core asset, and that's true for individual businesses, and it's also true for the, for the nation as a whole. Uh, so better understanding of of natural capital and how it affects the performance of systems at all scales, um, I think is, is becoming clear. There's the Natural Capital Coalition, which is a global network of financial institutions, I think, that are all uh, sort of on board with this, this idea of the need to, uh, to assess um, natural capital and put it on the books in, in a sense. Again, not necessarily trying to own it, but trying to, to understand how it contributes to, um, to businesses and how it also contributes to, to social well-being outside of the business uh, arena. There's been a huge increase in, in interest in ecosystem services, you know, now more than uh, 3,000 articles per year being published uh, on this topic. Um, <clears throat> this one is the most cited of all of those that we published back in 1997 and did a meta-analysis of what was available at the time uh, and showed that you know, the value of six, 17 different ecosystem services across 16 biomes was you know, on the order of $33 trillion a year, much larger than global GDP at the time. But not, we didn't mean pricing the planet, we really meant valuing the planet. And that distinction is important, I think. That we're not talking about exchange values; we're talking about uh, contributions to to well-being. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, looked at the uh, the losses in ecosystem service values when uh, land use change occurs, 
uh, particularly from you know intact ecosystems to something uh, something different, like intensive farming, or you know, um, from forestry to, to farming, uh, from mangroves to uh, to shrimp farming. It's an important one in the, in the coastal zone, um, etc. Um, we did an estimate a few years ago of the benefit cost ratio of you know um, investing in uh, preserving our natural capital, with, and we used a scenario where we covered uh, increase the global reserve network to cover 15% of the terrestrial biosphere, 30% of the marine biosphere. That would cost about 45 billion a year to build and maintain, but it would uh, it would the benefits the difference between the intact system and the what it would be ones it might be converted to is about 45 trillion a year. So very high benefit cost ratio for investing in natural capital um, assets uh, at this point, if, if you assess their value more, uh, more comprehensively. And again, I think this is a fairly conservative estimate because, of course, we're not assessing all of their contributions. Uh, we're always going to leave some, some things out. So, um, yeah, and this is, if I could read it on the... <laughs> That. <laughs> um, and this is the current um, reserve network. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm try when I try to do that, it's muting them. Yeah. Well, we yeah. well, you still have to put it somewhere. Push it over to the side. Yeah. This is not. Disable uh, participant oh. location. <laughs> anyway, keep playing with it. Well, um, this is just a list of some. This, this pad is a little bit temperamental. <laughs> <clears throat> so in terms of mangroves and, and coral reefs and, and wetland ecosystem services and what the, the benefits are um, you know, to, to all of those and what the, uh, <clears throat> the return on the benefit cost ratios are, are not quite the 100 to 1 we were getting for the global assessment, but it's still fairly high. And now we're stuck again. Somebody else want to join? Okay. Technology. <laughs> okay. So since 1997, as I said, there's you know literally thousands of new studies. This is from the TEAB uh, study, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, where they've assembled a global <coughs> expanding global database of all of those studies, and uh, and showing the the average you know per hectare value um, of all of the ecosystem services that they they study. And you can see that they, there's quite a range there, but uh, particularly coastal systems like coral reefs and coastal wetlands and, uh, and even open oceans you know, that, that are in the hundreds of thousands to almost hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, per hectare per year. Coral reefs are very invaluable. There are not that many of them you know, globally by area. Uh, the open ocean, not so valuable per hectare, but quite a few hectares. So you know, when you add it all up, uh, it becomes significant. Um, this is a summary from the, the TEAB database um, in, 19, in 2012, I guess, of just the number of estimates that have been made uh, for each of these different ecosystems. Um, the sort of the mean value, the standard deviation, uh, the median value, the minimum and the maximum values from all of the studies that have been done. So you can see that coastal wetlands have been studied uh, quite a bit, 139 different studies in inland wetlands, uh, quite a bit. Open oceans, not so much. You know, coral reefs, uh, a bit more. 
uh, coastal systems in general, uh, not too bad. You know, there's still a few that are left out altogether. Um, you know, deserts, um, ice, ice fields, etc. Things that we know have value, but just nobody's nobody's really done studies like this of them yet. Um, so we looked at the change in the global value of these ecosystem services based on that new data and based on data on how land use and sea use was changed, largely uh, loss of coral reefs, I think a big component uh, in the study, uh, but also loss of wetlands, loss of coastal wetlands, loss of inland wetlands. Uh, so due to all of that land use change, why did I put that one in there? Um, well, that's just showing you the, the um, average value that we used uh, per, per hectare per year, uh, showing uh, tidal marshes, mangroves, uh, coral reefs, you know, um, all in the, hun in the hundreds of thousands of dollars per hectare. Um, the way we did this study was to look at, first of all, how the area of each of those biomes had changed globally, uh, and then also how the unit values, as we learn more about these systems, the, we, uh, their values tend to increase, um, as, we, as we might expect. Um, and then we, we sort of looked at um, four different possibilities. If we just looked at the original 1997 values, but updated to the current system, if we change only the unit values, uh, if we change only the area, the land area, or if we change both the unit values and the land area, and comparing you know, those columns, uh, you can get a change in value of somewhere between four to $20 trillion a year in terms of the value of ecosystem services, much larger than the GDP of the United States. Um, and I would argue that the last column is probably the, you know, the best estimate because it's taking into account both the land use change and the, and the unit value change. Yeah, so here's the summary of, um, of what, what those changes are. Um, so, as I said, uh, you know, uh, getting at the true cost of of, uh, of everything that we're that we're producing and consuming is also an important use for ecosystem service valuation. And this company called True Cost is one of I think a few now that are that are estimating uh, what those external costs are. Um, and that includes the uh, uh, cost to marine and, and coastal systems. Um, and the way they do this is to look at not only what the uh, emissions and extractions of each company is, but the emissions and extractions of the suppliers of that company and the suppliers of the suppliers and all the way back down the supply chain uh, to see, you know, what's the total, total impact. And they find that, uh, you know, uh, particularly the primary production, primary processing sectors um, have huge, you know, external costs, um, you know, totaling what in this case 7.3 trillion uh, per year and um, they find that that maybe the majority of companies these days at least publicly traded companies you know are uh, produce have external costs that outweigh their their profits so they're not really making a social profit they're calling calling their external costs profits so that's not helping to achieve our ultimate goal of sustainable well-being um, and all of the price signals that we use, you know, when we, when we buy things in the market are, are distorted. So how do we change that? Um, can, can we solve this problem going forward? Um, so we have been losing value of ecosystem services up till, up till now. Um, what are the possibilities for the future? One way of looking at this is to look at some alternative scenarios going forward. Um, this is a group of scenarios created by the Great Transition Initiative. Um, they have you know, that sort of business as usual scenario, a um, policy reform scenario where there's more government intervention uh, to try to uh, take these things into account, a great transition scenario, uh, which is much more focused on well-being and um, I think incorporates the, um, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals more explicitly. Um, you know, what, does, what would life be like in each of these scenarios? I think it's important to get that point across to people uh, that we're not talking about, you know, uh, a sacrifice uh, to, to achieve this sort of world. It's really a sacrifice you know, sort of not to go there, uh, to allow the system to go in the, in the opposite direction. Um, anyway, there's a lot more to say about that, but um, we use those scenarios uh, to look at, 
what the implications would be for land use change and for ecosystem service management, which are built in. in the great transition scenario, for example, we, we do deal with climate change. You know, we do all of the things that are necessary uh, to, get, uh, to get climate to change. But uh, we also deal with inequality. We also deal with um, hunger. We deal with all of, all of the other things that are embedded in the SDGs. Uh, and, and fortress world, we obviously don't, or at least not for everybody. Um, there's much more inequitable distribution of wealth. Uh, we're not really focused on climate change, etc. Anyway, <clears throat> they have worked out um, what the land use implications of those scenarios are. This is the base case in 2011. And I know it's really hard to see the differences, but you can see if I go to market forces in the base case, especially in Europe, you see much more urban urban development, you see sort of increasing desert desertification in the Sub-Sahara and other places around the world, including, including Australia. New Zealand is almost off the map here, but <laughs> <We're> used <laughs> <to that. laughs> you're used to that. <laughs> Did you see recently that IKEA was selling a global map that did not have New Zealand on it at all. <laughs> they want to come into our market. And they want to come <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Did they, did they fix the map? You don't know? <laughs> or did you throw them out? <laughs> We're not on the map, you can't come here. Yet. <laughs> um, anyway, that's market forces, fortress world even worse. You know, policy reform, uh, not, not as bad. Great transition, you know, much better. Uh, so basically, uh, we could do the same sort of analysis that we did before and say, here's 1997, here's 2011, here's each of those four scenarios in terms of their uh, <coughs> land use, I think was that. Yeah, that's the land use in each scenario. And this is the ecosystem service values in each scenario. Uh, well, that's the unit values. And then this is the, the total uh, ecosystem service values. You can see a lot of red in these scenarios where things are going down, a lot of green in these scenarios where things are going up. And the bottom line, you know, is <clears throat> we can uh, continue the, the loss of ecosystem services in market forces or even worse in fortress world. We can sort of maintain where we are uh, or we can, you know, restore things quite significantly uh, if we, if we uh, use the right set of, of policies and management. Uh, this is what it looks like. On a graph, you know, so um, continue downward, uh, stay stable, or, or reproduce up to up to a level that's better than what we had in 1997. Indeed, this is what it looks like by country because land use change in different countries is going to involve different different ecosystems. Um, you know, the biggest changes seem to be where desertification is a problem uh, in, the, in the Middle East and elsewhere. Uh, but you know, overall. Uh, we, we can do a much better job uh, if we change our whole set of policies. Um, okay, run through the rest of this really quickly. Uh, we've done some studies at, um, um, at the, the level of catchments and coastal systems of the kind that you guys are interested in here, one in particular on the Great Barrier Reef um, and its catchment. And um, the, uh, the approach that we took there was one that uses this sort of scenario analysis uh, that we said, well, what if um, climate change continues um, in the way it's been going, uh, the sort of empty world scenario, uh, or what if we begin to deal better with climate change and we can maintain things below at least two degrees? Um, you know, that's going to have a big impact on the coral reefs, uh, what happens to water, to ocean temperature. Uh, on the other hand, the other big impact would be what they do in the catchment. You know, they can, do they get a handle on um, you know, nutrient uh, and sediment erosion into the reef uh, or not? Uh, and so that creates a set of four scenarios, uh, either the best of both worlds, where globally and regionally we're beginning to do the right thing, uh, or trashing the commons, you know, where at both scales we're doing the wrong thing, uh, or something intermediate. Um, from that, we can estimate what sort of land use changes that would imply, um, what sort of uh, <clears throat> uh, outputs into the reef that would imply, and what would happen to, to the reef itself, itself under each of those scenarios. And using some uh, modeling work that was going on at uh, James Cook University, uh, we could say what the implications for coral cover would be uh, for, each, for each of those scenarios. 
trash in the commons, there would be nothing left, you know, by 2070, <clears throat> maybe sooner, given what we know now about the the uh, impacts of, of warming on the reef. Uh, best of both worlds, we can maintain uh, the current the current structure at least, uh, you know, over the over uh, that time period. We then, using a sort of expert survey techniques, we ask, you know, what would happen under each scenario uh, to uh, the <clears throat> ecosystem services, to human well-being uh, uh, components more broadly conceived, uh, and, you know, sort of what happens when you add that all up. The trash in the common scenario, if you just look at the economic indicators, looks like the best, best way to go. Uh, but if you look at all of the, the indicators, uh, it's obviously the reverse that the uh, uh, the best of both worlds scenario <clears throat> is uh, is going to improve overall sustainable well-being much more. Um, there's also been some work recently about what what could we do, what kind of interventions could we do at this stage uh, to um, uh, to help the reef uh, to maintain it to maintain itself even under the the uh, uh, the current. Uh, Direction of of, uh, of climate change, and there's a whole range of interventions that have been that have been proposed uh, in terms of you know moving sort of warm adapted species from the northern part of the, the reef to the southern part of the reef where water is going to potentially get warmer. Uh, you know, uh, intensified conventional management, assisted gene flow, uh, a whole range of things. But our point here was. These have to be embedded in a more adaptive management sort of approach uh, to managing the coral reefs. And it also needs to be embedded in a better understanding, I think, of how the system functions from a, from a, um, a systems modeling point of view. Uh, so, and I think in general, that's a direction that we need to move in to better understand um, ecosystem services in these complex systems. Uh, that you know, there's not one right way to do this, but we need a more intelligent pluralism approach. We need to do this at multiple scales in time and space and complexity, and we can use it as a, a way to build consensus among different stakeholders in a participatory modeling uh, sort of framework that acknowledges uncertainty and limited predictability and, and the values that the stakeholders bring to this and the uh, takes a more evolutionary approach, um, a longer term approach to the, to the problem. Uh, there's a couple of examples we could point to. Um, this is a global model that we did uh, on that, that assesses ecosystem services in a dynamic framework that includes you know, the rest of the planet, essentially, um, <clears throat> uh, including the ocean ecosystems, the coastal ecosystems, 11 different biomes uh, in the biosphere and how those services contribute to uh, built human and social capital and human well-being more broadly defined. Uh, you know, you can get quite a bit of output from these kinds of still fairly simple models, uh, but, but uh, we ran this from 1900 through 2000 up to 2100, so for the next, up to the uh, end of the next century. Um, and, um, you know, Bottom line from this was, you know, the values of ecosystem services that we estimated compared to GDP, for example, were even higher than, than the estimates from the more static uh, kind of approach that we took before. We're working now, and, and several groups are working on building more generalized models that can be applied to ecosystem services. This is, you can't read what the acronym stands for, but that's okay. It's multi-scale. Um, integrated models of ecosystem services, uh, something that includes all of the different components that we're talking about, uh, but can be scaled from watersheds, you know, up to whole catchments and, and coastal systems, up to you know the entire global system. Uh, but but that can also incorporate how ecosystem services function in a dynamic way. Um, we're also working on embedding these these sorts of more sophisticated models in a game framework. Uh, that would allow people to, uh, you know, to interact with these ecosystems in a, in a more entertaining way. Uh, and by making it more entertaining, we can get uh, some significant new kinds of research out of it. And we can see how people behave in that game environment, kind of decisions they make, kind of information they accept. And it also has an educational um, side effect uh, as they learn what ecosystem services really, really are. And I'll end with this one, I think, <clears throat> uh, that in terms of management strategies, as I said, we're talking about 
uh, <coughs> common property resources, we're talking about public goods. Um, <coughs> Eleanor Ostrom has uh, the only woman to ever win the Nobel Prize in economics, you know, for her work on managing the commons. And she, <coughs> among other things, has come up with these, you know, eight principles for what you need to manage a common property resource effectively. Um, you do need to define clear boundaries um, and have to have matching rules, you know, for for, uh, for the common goods to the local needs and conditions. Um, you really need to have a much more participatory approach uh, that uh, those affected by the rules have to participate in constructing and modifying the rules. Uh, you have to make sure that the rights of community members are respected uh, by outside authorities, so you can't have the federal government coming in and changing things you know, arbitrarily. Um, <clears throat> there has to be a system that's carried out by the community members for monitoring behavior and, and enforcing the rules, graduated sanctions, you know, accessible, uh, low-cost means for dispute re re resolution, and um, <clears throat> the responsibility for governing the, the resource has to be uh, nested in tiers you know, from the lowest level to the interconnected system. So there's been a lot of work, you know, on how common property resources can be managed by the by the community, and I think what we need is to be able to to sort of um, expand on, build on these sorts of ideas, and build management systems that uh, around common property resources and common asset trusts. And I think I'll end it there. And thank you very much. Probably took up a little more time than we than I wanted. <laughs> thank you very much. But I'll blame that on the the computer. Well, thank you everyone for your patience. With we had a few technical um, hiccups, but we're going to open it up for questions. So both people who are present here um, in the Centre for Sustainability, if you'd like to start with questions, as well as people who have joined us online, um, the way to do that is to put your questions by raising your hand um, and we can either or you can actually type the questions and we should be able to see that and relay those questions to people. Let's we'll start with. You mentioned in, I think it was your last or second to last slide about the importance of including in these um, discussions people who want to use the resources, the common resources. Um, how do you ensure that there are also lots of people involved that might or might not want to um, use or use up those resources? Mm -hmm. For example, we had um, some experiences here with people setting up groups for deciding where and where in particular area should go, and then basically stacking those groups for the people who are exploiting the users of the mm -hmm. resources, mm -hmm. and having maybe one scientist and one or two. That's a that's a really good question. I think these participatory processes need to, to really be balanced in terms of the, the distribution of stakeholders and make sure that you include um, in a balanced way, you know, all of the, the stakeholders that, that would potentially benefit from from uh, from the resource, whether it's consumed or whether it's producing benefits without being consumed. I think that's where the ecosystem services come in. So it's really a, you know, a, a design process of how you assemble those groups and, and how much, uh, you know, making sure that you're not giving too much weight to any one um, stakeholder group. And that certainly happens, you know, unfortunately, a lot. <laughs> yeah, but I think it, um, if you're aware and, and can Control the design process from the beginning you can you can overcome that those power power differentials that, that are going to give you not the optimal result. Well, we have one question that's come in. Um, have you looked at the use of ecosystem services in relation to Tereo Maui? Which means what exactly? Indigenous yes. Indigenous mother chair in yeah. Well, I think that ecosystem services and that idea and uh, is to me more consistent with you know, the sort of indigenous and particularly Maori worldviews that you know that uh, the natural ecosystem is something that we all benefit from collectively, 
um, <clears throat> that we need to steward and maintain, you know, to, to maintain those, those sort of collective benefits. Um, <clears throat> one uh, <clears throat> Development that I've heard about recently here in New Zealand is the, the Wanganui River, you know, being given the rights of, of personhood. Uh, you know, so how do you how do you allocate uh, respect and and uh, you know to to the whole system and recognize that that's that's sort of a, an important you know component of the system. It's not just to be exploited; it's to be interacted with, you know, in a much more uh, <clears throat> um, interesting way, I guess. <laughs> And more sustainable way, and you know, and, re and realizing that the, you know the, that your benefits are coming from those from those systems as much as from anything else, and that we're part of that natural system and not apart from it. So I think that's totally consistent with the, uh, the Maori world, worldview, and we're just rediscovering that rather than discovering it. Yes. Um, do you think that there are any like? concrete steps that we can kind of timeline out for when we want or when we need things to happen like yesterday start with <laughs> and then go into the community side or like what's the path of least resistance yeah well that's a good question i'm not sure there's a one size fits all answer to that um, but i think we have to be open to opportunities when they arise um, and i think these sorts of major cultural changes happen often you know, with uh, tipping points. So it looks like nothing's changing, you know, for a long time, and things, but things are changing. Things are building below the surface, and you know, when you get the appropriate trigger, something will change seemingly overnight. So <clears throat> I think that's the situation we're in. You know, in many, in many, many cases, for how to manage these resources, we're beginning to understand better how what we need to do but making the change the talk i gave last night was about you know the fact that this is sort of an addiction that we're, we're caught in we're locked into the current set of behaviors just because of all of the positive feedbacks that, that they involve and you know changing from that to a completely different system is going to take you know some therapy <laughs> And that therapy can come largely from at least changing what our fundamental goals are. If our goals are sustainable well-being. That's going to lead to a different, different set of policies and outcomes, and a different way of thinking, way of people thinking about these problems, and potentially a major shift. So I would just like to allow one more question. I've been advised to wrap things up at two o'clock. Um, people, but we'll allow one more question, and and also people who are. Um, contacting us via a webinar, and if they want to put their questions forward, we will be saving those and passing those on to discuss offline if people would like to forward their questions. So we'll have one last question. You mentioned IPV as the sister of the IPCC. Um, if we think how long it took the IPCC to get to the stage where we've actually got some targets, <laughs> We're sort of in trouble. I wonder if you've got any advice on how we might accelerate the process with IPVS to come to targets of you know, really, really sort of making investments or avoiding shortfalls <laughs> in terms of all this valuation and what we're losing what we might gain. Yeah. Well, given the way those both of those processes are structured, um, I'm not sure it's really possible to <laughs> accelerate um, that very much. But it, but I think there maybe we need some additional parallel processes. Uh, so I talked last night about this, um, this emerging group called the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. Uh, you know, so I think we really need a movement that combines not just the environmental movement and climate people, but you know, the environmental justice and equity uh, people and you know, the sort of uh, economic prosperity uh, and distribution. You know, so it's like all of those, um, all of those groups uh, need to form a broad alliance to, to present enough pressure on the system to actually cause this, uh, the tipping point to, to occur. So <clears throat> take a look online for the Wellbeing Economy Alliance and, um, and join and, <clears throat> and tell your friends and, <laughs> and tell your employers and, <laughs> and tell your NGOs and actually your governments. Um, so there's a government group uh, that includes New Zealand and Scotland and Costa Rica and a few other countries. And the idea there, you can get 
uh, governments on board with the idea that the goal is not GDP growth, the goal is well-being, you know, and that's going to imply, you know, better treatment of um, climate and ecosystems and, you know, more equity and, you know, and uh, you know, all of the things that are included in the SDGs. So if you can get a you know group of governments that are pursuing that agenda instead of the GDP growth at all costs agenda, then I think we can we can flip things. I think that's a very positive message to end on. Um, and I'd like to once again um, thank Professor Costanza for visiting us here in New Zealand on the South Island. Um, Catchments Otago for hosting your visit here and the Sustainable Seas for arranging this webinar. Um, I, my understanding is that the intention is this webinar has been recorded as well and should be available through the, through the Sustainable Seas website um, if the technology allowed us to do that. And um, I'd just like to thank you again for a very interesting talk about encompassing all the challenges that we have got facing us in the future. But, um, certainly seems that a transdisciplinary approach of trying to understand how these systems work, understand what causes these triggers to cause tipping points will be one positive step yes. to taking us to a better um, planet going forward. So thank you very much. You're welcome. It's going to take all of us. <laughs> we all. <laughs>